This is where we lived until we split up. She moved up to Mill Valley. I've been trying to sell it. Twelve grand a year's went for the down payment. Man, how could you leave my car outside all these years? Why'd you put it in the fucking garage? Look at that dirt all over it. What if somebody stole it? Yeah, I had an alarm put on Here. Hey, you just push this blue button right there. You have no appreciation whatsoever for what's happening. That's what it is. You don't know that that car is flying. You know how much pussy I got because of that car? It's gonna be different. But Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte are back. Let me tell you something. I ain't working for you. I don't like you and I don't trust you. <laughs> Welcome back, Red. And they're making up for lost time. You got the same car, yeah. same clothes. That's the way I like it. I get attached to things, Reggie. I know that Another 48 hours. Oh, you're in trouble with the law this time. Good. <laughs> Eddie Murphy. Nick Nolte. I'm driving. I was wanting a chauffeur, Reggie. Another 48 hours. Hello, folks. This is the last call of Torchies. I am your, one of your hosts, Gary Hill. With me, as usual, is Cameron Scott. Greetings and salutations, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> also with us, as usual, uh, is Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? I have been having a very bad day. Actually, not. <laughs> Actually not but you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really. Yeah. Really uh, amped that up, you know, because when. The bus flips over twenty-five times. You know, it should happen. I thought it was thirty. I thought it was thirty-five times. What, whatever it was, it was, it was exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> he says he says he says seventeen times in the bar. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, over here, uh, if you guys didn't know, this is the show where we discuss all of Walter Hill's films and um, his directing credits. We need to get some of his writing credits before you know it. Maybe we'll uh, we'll, we'll go that way next. I I don't know, we'll, we'll, or we'll mm. decide what that's going to be. But this time around, we, we jump to a year later uh, in his career to uh, go back to the throwback of, of his of his film, 48 Hours, with another 48 Hours for, from 1990. Uh, this this stars, of course, your, your two main actors, because how can you do it without them? Uh, Eddie Murphy as Reggie Hammond. Nick Nolte as Jack Cates. Uh, Brian James comes back again uh, as Kehoe, one of, the, one of his cop friends. Uh, Kevin Tige joins the joins the cast as um, 
Blake Wilson, the the crazy DEA guy. I always love when he does mm-hmm. things. Um, he's always an asshole, but always, he plays it well. Yeah. Well, not not so much in Roadhouse. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. He he he's trying to, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Edel Ross comes back again for from Red Heat uh, to play Frank Cruz, uh, D- David Anthony Marshall as William Hickok, uh, one of our bad guys. Andrew Divoff as Cherry Gans, brother of uh, Gans from the first film, mm-hmm. played brilliantly by, brilliantly by Andrew Divoff. Um, one of my favorite parts about this movie, actually. Um, yeah, same. An unrecognizable Bernie Casey uh, in this movie. I didn't. Yeah. Know, I didn't know it was him until like, yeah, I really, really look at him, you know. Yeah, it's 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 the fucking gray hair. It throws you off, man. It's just like I'm. I'm just so used to all of his roles with him, you know, just having like the straight on black hair and like all this classic stuff from like the '70s and shit. And it's like, oh, oh shit, that yeah, that's older Bernie Casey here. Holy fuck, <laughs> yeah. Guy was a monster, man. Like you, you understand why he was protecting Eddie Murphy in this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh man, he punches that glass like nobody's business, man. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Tyrone Burroughs, our mystery man with the glasses, played by Brent Jennings. Malcolm Price, played by Ted Markland. Uh, Tisha Campbell shows up in this movie as uh, Bernie Casey's daughter, who falls into some some minor uh, peril in late, later on in the film. Oh man, this. Mm. Well, um, I'll, I'll get to some. This is directed by by Walter Hill. Um, Written by a lot of writing credits on this one here. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of oh, we wrote the characters from the first movie, so uh-huh. we get credit in this movie, you know. But, but I'll, I'll get I, this is this is strange because we're doing his films on uh, on two drink. John Fasano, um, mm. director of Black Roses and Rock and Roll Nightmare and Zombie Nightmare and The Jitters, had a screenplay uh, credit on this movie. Which is very interesting, because it's nothing like he's ever done. <laughs> no, it's it's totally out of his wheelhouse, right? He also did Darkness Falls, which is like what, and he this, did this. Okay, is that the, the Tooth Fairy movie. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't hate that movie. Oh, no actually. kidding. Yeah. I've actually never seen that. I have it's, never seen Darkness Falls. It, it does all right. Yeah, it doesn't suck as bad as you think it would suck. I put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it, it's got uh, it's got the it's got the girl who played the. Um, the, uh, the the demon who falls in love with Xander in uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? Uh, em, em, Emma Caulfield, yeah. Uh, yeah, Emma Caulfield, yeah. Uh, Anyanka, who I met in person, yeah. and I, a friend of mine wanted to get a stuffed bunny signed, and I didn't have the proper pen, but she signed it anyway, so there's that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you don't know about a, a Buffy, uh, Anya's terrified of bunnies for some reason, you know. Mm-hmm. I forget if she explains yep. why, but it's a thing in that show. <laughs> Another 48 hours. <laughs> Your cheap plot synopsis. Jack Cates once again enlists the aid of ex-con Reggie Hammond, this time to take down the Iceman, a ruthless drug lord operating in the San Francisco Bay Area. And boy, what a dumb ending that has. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, this is the fine. It's kind of, it's, I don't want to call it too little too late, but it's like too, 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 too early to have a throwback kind of thing. Because that's that's everywhere now, but I, I'll, I'll gonna do my, my gripes, and I, I I like this a lot more than the, than the first time I watched this, put it that way. But um, I'll give it to Cameron uh, to kick us off. Thoughts and um, salutations, all that stuff. Go for it, brother. <laughs> uh, you know, I love the first forty eight hours. We already know that, uh, but. I feel like you hit the nail on the head when you said it was almost a little too little too late with this one. And it felt like a very safe sequel, you know, like it just like, oh, we're just going to hit all the same beats. We're going to use the same music. We're going to use some of the same one liners, the same jokes, mm-hmm. even the yeah, I mean, even the same theme song, you know, but it, like it has aged better than I remembered it. You know, like I remember not liking it when it came out very much like it was just OK. It was just very, very passable. But like, I think it's aged a lot better. It's uh, mm-hmm. the the action beats are you know pretty good. I love Edel Ross in it. You know he's he almost completely cut out of the damn movie. I know it had a lot of post production problems where they 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 cut out like forty fifty minutes of this. Yeah, thing. they they I chopped can't imagine like a, cutting out they, that much of the movie. They chopped a third of the original running time out of this movie. Like what? Right. Yeah, and the thing that we've never seen announced that footage, other than mm-hmm. like, the trailers and whatnot, it, 
and I know this is what like you know drove a wedge in between uh, Brian James and Walter Hill. He said he, after this movie, he stopped giving a shit about the movies. He just wanted a paycheck, which you can't blame him. You know, yeah, yeah Kehoe is, uh, is just pretty much you know <laughs> sliced down to like a, a glorified extra in this movie. But I, I think Andy Murphy is really good in it. Nick Nolte is is you know he slips right back into Jack Cates pretty easily. Oh. And, you know, I like a lot of the, the, like I said, the action beats in the space that Andrew Deboff is the MVP of this movie. Like, he is the first thing I remember ever seeing him in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, 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 he left that impression on me. I was pointing out to my wife when we watched it this afternoon. I'm like, that's the Wishmaster. <laughs> She's like, get the, get the fuck out of here. You know, I'm like, nope, nope, sure is. But uh, I, I, I can't say I love this movie, but I do I do like it. I like it a lot more than I did in the past. And it had been probably several years since I've seen it. So I was thankful thankful to, to the Torchy show to kind of, you know, put back me into a corner and say, you got to watch this. <laughs> mm. But, uh, you know, I, I, I can I can safely say I like it. I just don't love it. It feels like a very safe sequel. And you know, that's my two bits. You bring up the, the, the score of the movie. And it's done by James Horner, who also did the score of Commando. So when mm-hmm. I'm watching this movie, I hear the pan drums and the same fucking music from Commando. And yep. like, motherfucker, I saw Commando. You're better than this, okay? You just use the same <laughs> shit, you know? No, it's James Horner. He's not He's not better than this, actually. That's the thing. Like, when I first saw Commando, I was just like, that sort of sounds like the 48 Hours music. <laughs> it's like James, James Horner, okay, yes, he's good. But he ain't above like reusing his shit for another paycheck. Like that that's just what he does. Like you know, it, it's fine. <laughs> but but it's not like music like like Danny Elfman. Well that kind of sounds the same. That sounds very Elfman esque. Mm-hmm. This is the same exact music from Commando. I, oh yeah. I, I, yeah. I, can, I can just picture Arnie just throwing somebody off a cliff and shit like that, you know. That that uh Hey Sally, remember I said uh, I kill you last? I lied. I lied. Yes. I lied. <laughs> I eat the green Yeah, that's right, you said breakfast. that, Matrix. <laughs> I lied. So good. Mm-hmm. You'll know when it's good to happen because all fucking hell is going to break loose. <laughs> <laughs> Anything left for us? Just bodies. Mm, yeah, don't yeah. bother my friend. He's dead tired. <laughs> yeah. um, now I'm going to go fuck Tommy Chong's daughter later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Commando's real good, y'all. <laughs> Lee Russell, what about this? Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so I think I didn't. I didn't listen back in our forty-eight hours episode, but I think I did mention that I saw this first before I ever saw the original forty-eight hours, and uh, I think the the lasting impression of this film was like my uh, adolescent uh, uh, attraction to Kitten and uh, Tavadad's uh, boobs on the big screen, getting the motorcycle driven through them when, when they when they go through the, the screen in the in the porno theater or whatever. Most memorable um, part of the movie, but I must yeah. say. Um, yeah. Uh, rest in peace, kitten. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I I remember seeing this on TV a lot and just thinking, eh, it's pretty good. And then, you know, I saw the, we saw 48 Hours, and we did 48 Hours, and 48 Hours is pretty fucking great. Um, I think this is not as bad as I was remembering it in the back of my head. Uh, like I was just kind of had convinced myself, oh yeah, this is kind of a retread. Uh, Red Heat's kind of a retread as the, of the same themes as well. And, you know, Walter Hill's just kind of like coasting on sort of the same shit he's been doing in, in those other films. And, and to some extent that's true, but I think this one still keeps the same tone and the same energy of the first one to pretty, a pretty great degree. Like, uh, part part of the reason I think is fucking uh, Eddie Murphy, who at this point was like one of the biggest stars in the world, oh, actually has a fire at this point. Yeah, has a writing credit on this. Like like he he has the story idea for this. Like he went to Walter Hill and said, "Are we going to do a fucking sequel to this shit?" And Walter Hill's like, "I guess yeah, we'll do it if we can, you know, keep the tone consistent with the first one and you know keep the same energy and shit." And I think they do a pretty good job of that. Like. You know, all the problems aside with like cutting so much out of this movie were to the point where you can you can tell like it's kind of janky and it and there's a lot that is cut out. Like you can just kind of tell like, wait, why are we here now? What's going on here? But at the same time, you know, it's Walter Hill, his action, 
uh, directing is so good that it, he can kind of like carry you through it and you, you forget to ask those questions. Um, but I think for the most part, this works like it, it brings back these two characters. It plays perfectly as like a proper sequel, even with its problems, because, you know, it's got, uh, you know, it, it's got the same edge. It's, it's got good performances. Um, it ties to past events in the first film and resolves lingering issues, but at the same time, it's its own standalone story, just like the first film was. So I think it's actually a much bigger success than maybe a lot of people give it credit for. And I mean, I think the box office, you know, kind of speaks to that because this must be one of Walter Hill's biggest box office successes when I was looking at the numbers. Uh, you know, $50 million budget, $153.5 million return. That's pretty fucking good for Walter Hill because he usually doesn't get that kind of return on his films. No, so, no. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, you know, uh, short short of it, uh, I really like this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's anywhere near his best stuff, but like as a as a kind of a sequel that should be a throwaway sequel, it doesn't feel like one to me. Like it, it's it's got a lot going for it. Yeah, first off, you know, the, the opening of this film uh, is pretty spectacular. It sets up these bad guys pretty well. Mm-hmm. Andrew, Andrew Divoff and um, I forget the other actor's name. This is his, his partner in this this, this this brotherhood biker gang. Uh, 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 David Anthony Marshall Yeah, is Willie Hickok. And, and then their, their contact is um, Ted Markland as uh, Malcolm Price. And he, and he was like a... 60s 70s like tv western actor for the most part Mm -hmm. and like he he fits right into this as like you because the the opening of this is basically once upon a time in the uh in the west the opening to that for the most part yeah yeah, that's pretty cool it sets up these guys pretty 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 badass and gives you div off who doesn't say it in the the imdb stuff but i've talked to div off about this movie at at least one time and yeah, he he mentioned that he spent real time with with L.A. biker gangs to 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 prepare for the role. So hmm. he was uh he had that built in hard ass into him because he he kind of kind of kind of ran with them for a little for a little bit, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned this uh, uh probably one of his biggest box office successes. I mean that's based on yeah you know, the, the 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 popularity of Eddie Murphy at this point, which is right. catastrophic. I mean. It's not it's as big as Jim Carrey was probably a couple of years later. I, I'd say. Well, there 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 is a nice trivia note here, right? Hmm. Where um, Eddie Murphy's paycheck for the original Forty Eight Hours was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and Nolte's was a million. And for this one, apparently Nolte got three million, and Murphy got seven million. Ooh, well, that's a pay bump. Well, his production company is is on this same on this movie mm-hmm. too, so I'm sure he got got that back back end from that too for sure. Oh yeah, he's got a piece of it, right? Like he, any any time this movie gets watched, he 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 gets a few pennies. And I think there was that since um, I think since I don't want, I don't want to say the Golden Shops. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty I'm almost 100 percent positive uh, Beverly Hills Cop Two had his production company on it for sure. Uh. At the very least, at the very least, three. I'm pretty sure had it. Yeah. And and like I I think there's a, like a couple writers on this that have like a connection to part three, if I'm not mistaken, something along those lines. Like uh, there's a there's two, there's so many writer credits on this. Yeah, there so there's like crazy. seven, eight of them. <laughs> something like yeah. that. <laughs> including <clears throat> including Walter Hill himself, and it's like you know you got Larry Gross here who did the original 48 Hours and Streets of Fire. And I mean, it's got Stephen E. D'Souza, you know, with Commando, Running Man, Die Hard, Die Hard Two, Street Fighter, Judge Dredd. Like, it's the entire like 1990s. It's kind of in in the late 80s, 1990s. It's like the the writing credits here. Like, you got the guy who wrote The Fugitive, and Leviathan, and and you got the guy who wrote Terror Train and Turner and Hooch and Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. <laughs> Stephen E. D'Souza. That guy wrote so many stupid things on television and film that I love so much that, mm-hmm. that I'm not even ashamed. I say I love the the the, the Stallone Judge Dredd movie. It's just, and people say, "Oh, that one's so terrible." No, it's just it's just tone. It's fun. It's toned differently than the other one is. You know? Yeah, it's it's fun. It's like, I, of... I I prefer the Carl Urban one, of course, because it's truer to the source material. But the fucking Stallone one's fun. 
The Stallone one is fun. The only the bad thing about that movie is uh, Rob Schneider. <laughs> he's mm-hmm. just un- insufferable in that. But that movie's a hell of a lot of oh, fun. He's so he, over the top. He's got some bits in there. Come on, man. Hello, Cursed Earth Pizza. Come on, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but this the was movie, really, the, this, the movie oh, that that was su- such a hard time to the film that Scott Wilson didn't want credit for it. Oh boy, Oof. <laughs> yeah, this is good though. I mean, it's kind of like the first forty eight hours without the casual racism of Nick Nolte because that's kind of gone now. He's not calling him right. water, watermelon or nothing like that in this movie. He so, stopped drinking, so you know he stopped drinking, so he became less racist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Still smoking like a chimney, but he quit drinking. Oh, yeah. he sounds like fucking Roddy Piper in this film, right? Like he, he, at this point, he's like full peak Nolte voice, and he's just he just kind of sounds like Roddy Piper half the time. It's just it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, I go way back with Kevin Tige, and we talked about him on the Tales from the Crypt episode. If you guys are Patreon members, um, but I, I watched him on emer- Emergency with my with my mother way back in the day. Uh, he hmm. was uh, he was on that TV show about paramedics and. Um, and of course, the Roadhouse was was big in my house. You know, thank you TBS for the movies for for, for guys who like movies. Uh, thing. Mm-hmm. You, you yeah. Play, you... Between that and Tango and Cash, I think I watched those the most on there. You know. God, <laughs> if, if they must have gone through so many like videotapes of those films, like over, the way they played them over the years, like. They must have had like four or five copies of each on hand because they burnt through that for those fuck those two movies especially. My God, they were always on TBS. Yeah, I would love to see you know more of this cut one day. I know we got a 4K Blu-ray out of both these movies, but no real new extras on there besides like the interviews of Walter, new interviews of like Walter Hill and stuff like that. But there's no like super yeah. cut of, of these scenes that we missed with with Brian James and I'm sure more Ed O'Ross. Who, who wears the most unfortunate dad sports jacket as a police officer I've ever seen in my life. You know? <laughs> yeah, shit. He looks... <laughs> I think that was Judge Smell's jacket from Caddyshack. <laughs> I, I, I was immediately like, this is Herb Tarlick as a cop. Like, this is... <laughs> my God. Like, What's, what's that Ackroyd's character name? Oh, Fred Garvin, male prostitute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looks like to me, that jacket. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, they're working, but Bernie Casey, for for the five minutes you get of him, you know, it, it, it's working real well in this movie. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they go to go visit him, and he, he gets so angry, he punches through the prison glass. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you believe like he's it. In there, he's in there for life. He was, what are they going to do, bump it up to never, ever going to get out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you believe it because he's like this big, gruff-looking dude in this movie. I mean, he's, he always had like a tall, like, stature figure to me. I mean, ever since... Revenge of the Nerds, and you see, you know, the tri show up. Well, the, the, the black ones show up, and uh, he gives that big old point to to, to um, UN. Gives that big old point to the to, to the coach and the and the principal, and it's like right. he, he means fucking business, man. Every fucking time now, but um, the fact that he looks so gray and gruff in this movie, like I said, unrecognizable, and he punches through the glass. I was like, yeah, this motherfucker means business. I'm, I'm all I'm all yeah. for it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he just he just sells it as like a guy who was like a bad guy in like a black exploitation film who went to prison and he's been there ever since. Like, yep. And it like, and and he's he's a big part of like how well Walter Hill balances the more like jovial, lightheartedness of the film with the serious shit. Like it, it like I said, this film still has that edge that the first film had, yet it still perfectly balances the comedy too. And I. I, I do kind of feel like some of Eddie Murphy's stuff in this is a little bit like a little cloying at times. Like sometimes he's he's getting a little too annoying. Like I've seen this from you before, Eddie, and you can stop. But for the most <laughs> right. but but for the most part, it works really well. And like you know, uh, Bertie Casey stuff, like that's that like serious edge at the heart of the film, and you got the comedy kind of like floating around it. Um, and and also I did, I just like that you know they it's Nolte now who has to kind of humble himself a little bit to Murphy like uh, these unresolved issues between the two characters and Nolte has his back against the wall because he's he's his job's on the line basically and because you know he's not necessarily a super dirty cop but he's crossed the line way too much to the point where it's like we're gonna nail him on on this shit. And uh, and also, of course, he's got 
you know, he's got uh, Kehoe working behind the scenes trying to get him out of the fucking department anyway. But um, I just, I just like that, like the buddy thing here solidifies more. Like you can tell by the end of the film, they really do like each other and respect each other. And like, you know, the bar fight scene where, um, oh, love the bar we're, scene. you know, we're, we're, <laughs> by the way, again, not a torchies. Yeah, what's up with that? Well, Bar- barn barnstormers. What is this bullshit? Like, fuck you. Um, and then there's another one like called the bird cage or some shit. Like, can you not make one of these torchies? Like Walter Hill, what are you doing? I want the Walter Hill cinematic universe. I need a torchies in every film. The the like, if you were to correct anything in all your movies, they need to have a torchies. That's the connecting line. But uh, you know, I guess I'm just a better filmmaker than Walter Hill. What can I tell you? But <laughs> um, but uh, like that bar fight, like Nick Nolte starts getting into it with these fucking dudes who re- recognize him as the cop that like busted him for you know getting caught with an underage girl or some shit, and. Eddie Murphy starts to like smile because he's like, oh shit, he's going to get into a fight. He's going to fuck some people up. I like this. And then he sees him getting his ass kicked and immediately his expression changes to like, oh shit, I got to help his ass. And so like, you can tell there's, right. You can actually tell there's a, there's like a, there's a bond between the two characters uh, just, just through, you know, the physical acting and stuff. You know, even if it's not necessarily spoken in the dialogue, there, there is a camaraderie there that uh, they sell. They have the chemistry. Like they really do have the chemistry. It has not been lost from the first film. They just they pick it right back up, like it was you know yesterday. I mean, there's been there's been these culture clash type movies where it seems so fucking forced. Like I can tell you that I still really enjoyed the first Rush Hour movie, but the second Rush mm-hmm. Hour movie, they're just doing the same shit. Right. You know, yeah. The same yeah. jokes, the same this, that, the other. I can't say the same thing about those Shanghai movies. I still enjoy, pretty much enjoy both of those, but um, this movie it, it kind of gets past it a bit, like you said. They become, they become respectable of each other, and they, these this stuff with the bad guys intermixed, you know, especially the guy you know nothing about, pretty much going in, uh, Tyrone Burroughs, mm-hmm. the guy with the guy with the glasses, the the, the money man, if right. you will, you know, who you have no idea why he's at this racetrack, you have no idea about anything. It's just the fact that you can tell that he's the guy, but you you, you don't know really know why. He's doing some nefarious you know? shit. You yeah, know? you know he ain't up to he's up to no good. I got I got to give respect to that character too. He's a hard motherfucker, man. Because he gets his ear shot off and he still laughs in their fucking faces. Like he, tell, he tells them straight up, that doesn't change the job, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got, I got to give it to him, man. Like that, that, that's a, that was a surprising character moment. I was like, oh shit, he, he, he knows he's probably gonna die, but he don't give a fuck. He's still gonna tell him fuck off. I like it. Uh, Malcolm Price, uh, Ted Markland is the actor's mm-hmm. name. I thought it was MC Ganey at first when I first saw him, but it, it, right. was, it wasn't. You know. Yeah, he's got that look, right? <laughs> yeah, he's he died in like 2011 or something like that, but. Um, yeah, yeah, you kind of not not a I, I wouldn't say an old time cowboy actor, but he was definitely on the tail end of like the peak of the cowboy kind of thing, like you know sixties, seventies, and like I said, he was doing a lot of cowboy TV. He was also he's also in um, Walter Hill's Wild Bill later on, like in ninety five or whatever. Ah, okay. I thought he was Franco Nero for a half a second and like he just shaved the top of his head and gave him. Wow, well, I yeah, I don't I don't know if Franco Nero would do that honestly. I, I don't, that's why I looked. I'm like, nope, it, that can't be Franco wouldn't like that shit. But he's got the eyes, right? That was that was the thing, right? He's like, you <laughs> right. see that dude's eyes, and it's like even in the movie, like the, uh, um, I think it's the uh, I think it's the Asian uh, prostitute says, yeah, it's the it's, yeah, it's the hot Asian prostitute who shows her tits in the uh, hotel. Um, She's like, you know, this guy, you know, long hair, big eyes. Like, <laughs> yeah. Man, I love the line. You know, I got I to put something on. So uh, old uh, Reggie bends down to look through the keyhole. And it's a good mm-hmm. thing he did, too, because uh, uh, Mr. Gans comes out blasting, you know, because he's, he's getting him a piece whilst. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm starting to pick up that Hill really likes the setting of, like, a seedy motel for a gunfight and shit. Like, th- I think this is maybe the third time we've seen it in one of his films, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah. Third, yeah. third or fourth, and then we, yeah. know we see, definitely see it again. So, yeah, so, I mean. So, so much semen in that room, you know, much like uh, we discussed. Oh. Um, me and Iris just discussed Chained Heat 
where John mm. Vernon is the warden in that movie. There, there's so much semen all over that office. It, it's ridiculous. Oh, you, you know? know he doesn't clean that. He doesn't clean that jacuzzi. <laughs> no. He, he you change. want to throw? You want to throw up? Just shine a black light around that motherfucker. Yeah, he, he don't change the water. <laughs> Those aren't bubbles. That's that's floaties right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think what this film does, I think better than the first film is. The first film's all about the chase. You know, he's after his mm-hmm. money. He uh, Gans and is is after him, and vice versa. This one dedicates more time to the action set pieces, I think. You know, in the club, mm-hmm. and there, there's the scene where they they have to chase on the motorcycles. Where you, you mentioned they 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 ride right through the the porno theater. At, um, right. Great action set piece in that sense. And, and another one, bus. Quite, sorry. Another, yeah. another bus get flipped. Mm-hmm. Another, another bus gets flipped. Yeah, the bus flipping, you know, that was all done practically. They they shoot the tire and the bus. Uh, I, I doubt anybody was on that said bus, but, you know. No, um, nobody but Alan Graff. Yeah, yeah no, there. Who has a speaking part in this movie, so there's that, you know. Uh, yeah, and, there, and there's a, um, and I did catch this. I was looking, uh, uh, I, I was looking at the uh, IMDb trivia for this and I did catch this while I was watching it if you if you do look close like they try to cover it with smoke but there you can see like the kind of piston device they use to like flip the bus oh. <laughs> or as they do it it, it you know it, it's a kind of a blink and you miss a thing but like it, it is there so like the pretty pretty impressive fucking stunt work and shit in this like again you know Walter Hill he, he does not fucking you know shortchange you when it comes to the action scenes and stuff no. like it, it's just it's uh, if if anything it's probably his, his foremost uh consideration for stuff like this so well the action is certainly escalated in this movie or, or elevated mm-hmm. you know there's there's every every other car is getting blown up everybody's getting shot and flying through the air on, on like you know like oh, yeah. they get hit with projectiles right yeah, I was, I was about to say, like, it's very over-stylized. There's plenty of, like, guns that rarely run out of bullets until, like, it's a dramatic thing that has to, you know, be a story beat. Um, and, you know, especially at the end where, like, our two bad guys, they both get, like, shot through windows or whatever, and they get, like, propelled, like, ten feet backwards from, like, two or three shots from, uh, like, the Magnum or whatever that case has. But it's, like, that that gun would not do that <laughs> at all. Although I will say the gun that he shoots uh, at the end there where, you know, he, um, Kehoe is holding Eddie Murphy uh, as a shield. When when uh, Kate shoots Eddie Murphy, um, that bullet would have went through his shoulder and into Kehoe. Like, that would have been the thing. Yeah, that, that, that should have been the way they should have ended it, that he shot him with both of them with the, with the same bullet. You know, that, mm-hmm. would have been a, that would have been a much better way to go than just him because he fires seven rounds out of that gun at the end. Right. It's just like, oh, man, come on. Was was nobody counting? You cut 45, 50 minutes out of this movie, but nobody was counting shells? <laughs> I mean, that's where Brian James gets fucked the most, I think, is because mm-hmm. it's revealed in the end that, that um, the Anna Ross character, the, the, the cop within the department, is the Iceman, the reason why Jack Cates can't get shit done. But all of a sudden, here comes Keo just showing up right behind him saying, by the way, I'm a bad guy, too. Like, where the fuck did that come from? It just came out of nowhere, you know? It, no, no, but 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 it's Keo who's the Iceman, right? And I thought I thought Edo Ross was the... Yeah, uh, Edo Ross was just, was just kind of like acting manager. Yeah, because he, <laughs> he was another red herring as far as I was concerned. Like, he's still a bad guy. But like they they first have the uh, DA character or whatever or the uh, internal investigation uh, character as like oh that that has to be the Iceman that's the guy I've been chasing forever and I'm gonna go to a, to the trial and embarrass myself by yelling at him um, so further cement the fact that I'm gonna get prosecuted right but then they get to the shootout and it's like they're fo- like he notices the case character and follows him to the club. But the case character is kind of just like the guy who handles all the shit on the phone. Kehoe's the real ice man. Kehoe's the guy who set up all the plans and stuff. Like he even says as much when when they when they you know have a little bit of a conversation between you know um, Brian James and uh, Nolte have a little conversation while they're shooting. He's like, I had to do this to set you up. You were getting too close. So it's like it's actually Kehoe who's the ice man, and I kind of like that more. 
to a degree because like Brian James kind of plays his character, uh, you know, as the cop character, just kind of dumb, like just kind of like uh, just kind of yeah. like normal dumb cop, but really yeah, same as he was in the first movie, you know, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. All, all it, I'm saying, I needed an I am Spartacus moment in, in that club scene, and then Keo <laughs> just pops up and says, "No, no, I am the Ice Man," and then, you know. Well, he yeah, I all, mean that that, that would have been good too. I, I mean, and still, he still gets the. Sh- he still gets shortchanged by the by the script. Like he he deserved a better like final scene and shit. He's he's just kind of like an afterthought by the end when they actually have the shootout and stuff. It was just like at the end they're like, hey, we haven't figured out who the Ice Man actually is yet. We'll mm-hmm. just make him Brian James. And and like to be to be perfectly honest, it it's our biker duo that are really the main villains in this. You know the way the movie presents the villains in this film. It's still the biker duo who are the like the the real threat, the real bad guys in in a sense because they're the wild card, right? They're the cowboys in this film. Like uh, they, when we get to the end of the film, they're there to both kill the Ice Man and kill uh, Jack Cates because you know he killed the dude's brother in the first film. I mean, I, I love you know the, the part where they're at the club and. He's hanging from the cage, and the stripper bites him. Uh, Gans, that is. And mm. He gets shot, like, three times in the chest, but at the same time, you're just such a badass. Like, you know he's going to get up and try to shoot somebody again. And you know what? You get, right. you get your wish, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I love it, though, when Eddie Murphy just does that that laugh he was so famous for at the time. And he's just, like, when the gun clicks empty, and he's just like, oh, okay, let me spit polish my gun here. I'm going to take careful aim, and then his fucking gun is empty, too. It's just like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, uh, great stuff. Yes, the movie gods have not uh, granted you phantom bullets that should not exist anymore. So, well, that, yeah, uh, like, I think they said in the IMDb that they fired, like, 16, 15 or 16 shots from that gun before where it went from Hickok to Reggie. You know, mm-hmm. so nobody nobody reloaded that thing, <laughs> not at all. See, see, at least at least Brian James, he had an Uzi. So like, it's like, how do you count that? Like that, at least he's you know he's he's keeping it in reality. It's like I'm just gonna spray an Uzi across this fucking bar and try to kill everybody, and and you you can't really count the shots in that one. So it's good. Yeah, that's one of my favorite um, Robert Rodriguez moments when uh, our our mariachi uh, um, fucking Antonio Banderas is shooting up the Tarasco bar. And mm-hmm. the, oh, yeah. the yep. point where there's just him and the one guy left that keep picking up guns, they have no bullets in them. It's, it's, <laughs> it, 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 I love it so much because it has that realism to an action movie that, you know, it doesn't really exist in like a fantasy world, you know. But, but guns, yeah, do, guns no. do run out of bullets, yes. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that is a all-time brilliant little moment. But, um... Oh, much like you, Lee, I, I saw this on HBO be, it, the, before I saw the original one, and um, mm-hmm. because they played the ads for this like fucking nobody's business constantly on HBO, so it was on constantly, and I probably watched it a good three or four times before I saw the original. So well, I, I think this was, huh? I think this is a bigger hit than the original, right? So like, it just yeah. makes sense that this would be everywhere. Well, I think when I was watching HBO, it would be probably right around the, that nineteen ninety one, nineteen ninety two <laughs> era, where, to where. It would, mm-hmm. it would have played a lot, you know. Yeah, because um, it's got it's got everything. It, like it, it's got it's got action, it's got violence, it's got a little bit of titties in it. it you know, it, it's it's it is perfect for HBO in the early nineties. I, I think one fatal flaw in this movie uh, is that we all know that Eddie Murphy can do James Brown better. We've seen Saturday Night Live again, okay? Uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the singing when we, when he's doing Roxanne is just like. Oh, come, like Eddie, I expect more from. That's that's where more. I'm. That's where I'm saying he's grading when he's doing those little bits. Mm-hmm. And I, although I did enjoy, I, I did really appreciate the joke where he's like, you know, he's like, "Where's my James Brown tape?" And all he finds is like, "Man, fucking, they try to keep me and James Brown in jail." And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it just sort of point to the fact that James Brown actually did some fucking prison time because James Brown was not a nice man in real life. No, no. You know who wasn't a nice man? Jack Cates. Mm. No. He's like, I mean, he, he went from being a racist asshole in the first one to just just, just a plain asshole in this one. Like, oh, yeah. He, the whole idea that he's just like, you know, almost kind of uh, blackmailing Reggie to, to help him, you know, oh, uh, and keep no, his not, money. Not even almost. He is blackmailing him. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, Jack Cates is still a scumbag. He, he, he's still an asshole, but, you know, he's got his 
he still does kind of have his little code of honor going on, and he does respect uh, Eddie Murphy's character a lot more in this film than he did in the first film. That That's definitely for, there, there's some progression there. Yeah, you there's know. a little bit of progression. Now he's just stealing his fucking money, but yeah. <laughs> We never got the third movie to find out that if he, uh, you know, uh, kept that half a million away from Reggie in the first place. You know, hey, we could still do it. Yeah, come, on, still do- come on, Walter Hill. Let's let's do fucking <laughs> forty eight <laughs> hours too late. Let's do that one. <laughs> he, he pulled Kate out of the nursing home. We got one more case, Kate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I stole your money to pay for my nursing home stay. Just, just, He's like, yeah, well, I still got your fucking Zippo lighter, so fuck off. Yeah, just, I'm going to pull your ass out of hospice, Kate. <laughs> just, just grunts and whistles. He, so. He's got one, one leg. <laughs> it's like, you can't, you can't show that oxygen check too early there, Jack. Come on, they're going to shoot that fucking thing, you know. <laughs> Eddie Murphy pushing fucking Nick Nolte around in a wheelchair for the whole movie. That'd be... Oh, Bubba Hotep with Jack Case and it'd be Bubba Hotep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I'd watch it. I'd fucking watch it. I'd, I'd, wa- I'd watch an eighty-year-old Jack Cates trying to fucking navigate a you know hospice care. <laughs> just, just, just the novelty of Jack Cates' character being alive at eighty years old is is enough to sell me. It's like, how did he manage? <laughs> oh, one foot out of the iron lung. He, he's smoking. Yeah. A, he's smoking out of a hole in his throat. This movie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's down to one foot because he lost it to diabetes. <laughs> oh, he turns the hole in his throat into a at a working into a working flamethrower. Come on, these things write themselves, people. Come on, nice. yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll write it. Let, we'll write it. Let Walter direct it. You know, we we got to contact this guy. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you don't do it on digital, Walter. You got to do it on celluloid. <laughs> no, but good times, man. I, I had a, I had a, like I said, much better time watching it this time around than I ever did. So, um, I don't mm-hmm. know, why, I don't know why that is. Maybe I, I, I wasn't looking so much for our main characters. I was looking for the stuff around them. You know, maybe that's what it was. Because uh, that's really the stars of this movie. I think is the stuff around them. Yeah, like, like. It, uh... It does focus more on our main characters in a way, but at the same time, there's just like so much more interesting stuff going around them as well. And I kind of wonder what the longer cut, like the 145 minute original version of this looks like, like how much like is it to the point where Eddie Murphy is too over the top in grading? Like, is that what happens in the movie? Because that would be a bit weird i yeah. almost kind of i almost kind of wonder if this like imperfect like janky kind of like jerky paste kind of film is the best possible version of this you need you like you never know they had to make room yeah. for that they had to make room for that band that was clearly friends with eddie murphy in that movie just uh, oh yeah good good going in yeah i forget what they were singing but i i think they have i think because in the end in the end credits you hear the bus boys song that the boys are back in town mm-hmm. but then you hear another version in like about, about midway through and i'm pretty sure it's those guys do a cover of the boys are back in town it's like why do i, I want this right. when i know that when i hear the original boys are back in town i still really enjoy it you know yeah yeah um but i'll, I'll kick it back to camera anything else i can say about it? and um yeah we'll close it up with, with lee there um, like I said, I like this movie. I just don't love it. I, I, I but I like it a lot more this time around. You know, uh, looking at it with uh, not so much new eyes, but uh, fresher eyes. It was just, it was good to ha- sit down and have fun with a good old fashioned buddy cop flick. With you know where the the, the laughs are real, you know, but like the the action's real as well, and that's the, what kind of saves this movie. You know, again, I think it it just kind of at the same time it does in my opinion, kind of rehash a lot of stuff that just, I wish I did just been a little bit more original at, but I, I still can't help but like it. See, seeing Nolte and Eddie Murphy together, two people who should not have chemistry together and mm-hmm. it should not work, but it does. And, uh, I love, I, you know, I, I love the, their banter and Andrew Devop MVP. He, he's great in it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, overall, it was a good rewatch. I, I like I said, I, I like it a lot better now than I did back in the day. 
and I watched it a lot back in the day. So <laughs> I don't know what that says for as much as I was uh, kind of pissing all over, but you know, it's, I still like it. I can't help it. Lee. Yeah. Uh, removed from like, you know, adolescent watches of this, um, this works pretty well. It it doesn't embarrass itself compared to the original. I think was is kind of the big thing. It's like, it's very confidently done. It, it hits all the same beats of the first movie. It pretty much keeps the tone. Uh, it progresses the characters a little bit. And it's overall really fun and well made. Like even the fact that it's chopped down so much and, you know, like there are continuity errors and stuff and it kind of jumps through the story very quickly at times and short shifts like several characters. Uh, it still has that Walter Hill like breezy quality to it where he's doing so much on screen that you kind of don't care. You, you Like even, you know, even if there's stuff that's lost, you don't necessarily miss it. So like it still plays very well. I think the biggest problem with this is that it's a movie that came out in the same era as like extreme prejudice and Johnny handsome, which are just like Walter Hill at his peak. And this is just kind of right, like, right. It, it's, this is just kind of like mid level Walter Hill. It's just like, yeah, it, it's okay. He's making a big movie for, you know, a general audience and he fucking banked big on it, like big success monetary wise. And you can't fault him for that shit. And like at the same I mean, time, he got paid. Yeah. You know, he got, he got paid. paid. And he fucking made a crowd pleaser, even if it's not necessarily as interesting a movie as like Extreme Prejudice or uh, Johnny Handsome. It's still pretty good. It it just kind of pales in comparison to films like that in this era. So that like that's its biggest drawback, really. Like other than that, it's fine. It, it's definitely better than a lot of buddy cop shit before it and to come later. So check it out. Like, I, I, I feel like maybe people overlook this one, and they shouldn't. It, it's actually not that bad. Yeah, it's, this is better than most throwbacks, I'd say, of, of the of the same kind of genre. Yeah, you know, even, like, ones that are like this. I mean, it, it plays real well, considering they were came out in 82 with the first one, I think 82. It just came out in 1990. You know, it's eight years later. You would mm -hmm. think, that, you know, these guys getting back together would be kind of awkward, but they kind of jump right back into it. And I got to, re I got to respect them as actors for doing that, right. for taking the material and running with it. And like I said, it got, if it, his lower beats of the original one, like a lot more action set pieces. So he's going in to the nineties and recognize that he needs to add those elements in there, but not seeming forced, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Great character actors all around. Um, it, it makes it much more a winner than, again, I originally saw it. I, I really dig it, you know? And, um, Recommend it. I would recommend watching this along with the first mm -hmm. one. Um, next up, the next episode you hear on the regular feed is um, what do you do when you leave San Francisco? You go to St. Louis and you make a hood film. And it's one that I love so much. Uh, 1992's Trespass. If, if you haven't seen this, uh, yeah, people, a... it's it's really good. Um, Bill Paxton and William Southby firefighters who find a treasure map to a church in St. Louis where they're going to find some gold and shit. And um, Ice-T and Ice Cube are, are gang members along with some other folks. And I think they witness a murder, I believe. And they're, they're stuck in here and it's a siege movie. And Tiny Zeus Lister has uh, steel spiked cleats in this movie. And, and mm. uh, written by Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis, who's Zemeckis for some reason. I, I guess he was deep into the Tales from the Crypto gang at that point And, you know... Yeah, they said let's let's write a hood movie, and I love this hood movie. So, Trespass is next, and I can't wait, guys. Put it that way, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, 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 love, I, I also can't <clears throat> also can't wait to hear what the uh, Patreon pairing is going to be for that. I know what I'd pick, but you know. Uh... <laughs> oh, that's right. Is it my turn? If it's your mm -hmm. turn, yeah, I know what I would. Oh pick. shit! But um, the all right, off the top of my head, I'm throwing it out there because it's the first thing that came to mind. Salt on Precinct Thirteen. Okay. Oh, I, I was Those gonna I, I was gonna say Judgment Night, but you're welcome, dude. You know, it's it's uh, uh, <laughs> uh but yeah, yeah, Judgment next... Night. God damn, man, I should I should have went with that. No, it's okay. <laughs> you still can. It has it hasn't happened yet, but uh, mm -hmm. or we can play too. I don't give a shit. But <laughs> this is uh, the next <laughs> we'll, we'll 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 litigate this. Uh, yeah. 
have, have my guys call your guys. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, my representation, your representation. You know, not representing <laughs> anybody. You know, or misrepresenting <laughs> somebody. But uh, the next thing on the Patreon feed you hear from us uh, should be the um, the a film by Ray Shane Black, uh, starring mm-hmm. starring great Ryan Gosling and the great Russell Crowe. And um, the very brutal um, Keith David in that movie. We're doing the nice oh, yeah. guys from 2016, and um, I, I've done this before on the, the Christmas. Uh, I, I, I'm bleeding for a Black Christmas on the Cinema Beef podcast. I think with Doug Tilly. But I'm looking mm. forward to talking to him with, with with you guys. And um, yeah, you'll hear that on the Patreon. So if you didn't pay your two dollars yet, go pay your two dollars, and that's where you'll exclusively hear those episodes, the bonus yeah, ones. And- and you don't just get us. You get, like, a ton of other shit on the Patreon. You get the fucking cinema psyops with the actual music, not the compromised bullshit music they have to put on the main feed where, you know, because otherwise they get hit with copyright strikes. Yep. You, you miss you miss Cork getting, you miss Cork getting in, inspired by, by stuff and put music in there, so. Yeah. <laughs> you, you get you get those pirate radio cuts on, on just the Patreon, so go, go, go get on that, y'all. That's a... Uh... Yeah, and you get a multitude of other stuff too. It's not just us. It's you know, it's, it's other excellent podcasts. So like, it's two dollars. You are paying two dollars for literally, I don't know, twenty, thirty hours of entertainment every month. Yeah, more, more hour, more hours uh, that you could listen to in one fucking day. You know? Yeah, you pay more for a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee than you do the mm-hmm. Patreon. You know, <laughs> or, that's right. Or t- and we'll keep you awake a lot better. Or Tim Hortons, respectively, sir. You know, <laughs> uh, pfft, yeah, whatever. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's all you know, it's all uh, commercial gutter coffee. It's fine. <laughs> but that is the end of this one. We'll see you next time for trespass. Like I said, I can't wait. And um, yeah, good shit. Uh, this has been last call of torture.